good. Uh, he's, had, he's had years of experience he's been drawing on that thing. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter number 3. Matthew chapter number 3. Sometimes, you know, the, the Bible uses figures of speech. And sometimes in the Bible, when it uses the word all, it doesn't mean all. If you look at Matthew chapter 3, look at verse number 1 with me. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice their message when John the Baptist came preaching in Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. It was the good news of the kingdom being at hand, that kingdom that Israel was expecting. Verse 3, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. This is what Mark calls the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins in Mark chapter 1. But notice here when Matthew says that when John the Baptist was baptizing, he says Jerusalem came out to him, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan. Now when the Bible says that, do you think that it means that literally every single person in Judea went out to be baptized of John? Do you think that every single person in the surrounding regions came out and was baptized of John? Did the Pharisees get baptized? Where were the Pharisees located? They were in Jerusalem, in Judea. They didn't get baptized. They didn't, they didn't know, they didn't want to have a, a part of what John was doing. So... The point is, is that no, not everybody was baptized. And the word all here is used as a figure of speech to mean many. We do this all the time in our lives. You know, when we say, we use figures of speech to add vivid effect to things. Like when we say that um, everything is going wrong. Well, that statement is self-defeating, right? Because if everything was going wrong, then your vocal cords wouldn't be working. You wouldn't be able to say that everything is going wrong if literally everything was going wrong. And the other figure of speech, we, another one I just thought of off the top of my head, is sometimes we say, I have a ton of things to do when I get home. And uh, obviously, you don't have things to do that are a weight it doesn't literally weigh a ton, the things that you need to do, but we use figures of speech in our expression to convey thought and to convey meaning, right? To add effect. So too does the Bible use figures of speech. I wanted to go through a, a few of them with you just to point them out. Turn over to uh, Psalm 90. Look at Psalm 90. just want to look at a couple of figures of speech in the Bible. Psalm 90 before we move on in the lesson. Psalm 90 and verse 4 says this, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. That's similar to what Second Peter chapter 3 says, you know, the saying that you're familiar with, where he says, One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as, is as one day. Is it literally a thousand years are one day? Well, no, that would be the law of non-contradiction put into effect. A day is a day and a year is a year, but that's conveying what it is in God's presence and in His mind. Look at Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Another figure of speech. Proverbs 1 verse 20. It says, Wisdom crieth without, she meaning wisdom, uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city she uttereth her words. Now does wisdom have a voice? Is it a female voice? Does she cry out? Does she utter her voice in the streets? No. That's a figure of speech to tell you what wisdom does. When wisdom sees something going on in the streets, what does it do? It cries out in your mind, doesn't it? You know right from wrong, and it cries out that this is wrong. So this figure of speech is used to add, add effect. Turn over to Matthew chapter 23. 
This is one of my favorite figures of speech in the Bible. Matthew chapter number 23 says this, verse 25, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Is he really talking about cups and platters? Let's see. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Even so ye are also outwardly appear Righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. There's a simile, a figure of speech, where he's, comp can, he's comparing a tomb that somebody has painted white to make it look pretty on the outside, but inside is just full of dead men's bones, full of nothing, right? Full of hypocrisy. And he's likening this to a man who's walking around, a simile. Um, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, he talks about how ye are the salt of the earth. You remember that? Are you, are you literally salt? Are you, are you, are you a, of, of course not, our bodies are not salt. We are not literally salt, but the Bible uses this to talk about how a salt has lost its savor. And if it does that, then how is things going to be salted? So it uses this as a metaphor, an implied comparison between two things. One last one, look over at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. It says in verse 5 of Revelation 1, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, did he literally wash you with his blood? Did he put you in a shower that had his blood that poured out upon you? No. That's a figure of speech to explain what his sacrifice did for you, what his blood accomplished. It washed you. It made you clean. So there's this metaphor being used to explain to you about something that's going on in the Bible. So... There are metaphors used in the Bible, and we covered an example where all doesn't mean all, right? When all of Judea went to John to be baptized. But what I want to talk to you, to, uh, to you about tonight is a time in the Bible where the word all literally means all. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter number one. There's a time in the Bible where the word all literally means all, and it's very important for you to understand what is being discussed and this all that it's being referenced to. Important for you to understand, f to know who you are and what God's plan is and what He's doing and how you're a part of it. Let's, let's read Ephesians chapter 1. Let's begin in verse 3 for you to get the context. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Notice that you're blessed with in heavenly places, and notice that He has chosen us in Him before, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, 
both which are in heaven and which are on which are in earth which are on earth even in him so when ephesians 1:10 says that god is going to gather together in one all things in christ he literally means all things it's not a figure of speech where it means many or most this is a case where the word all is used to mean literally all. Notice those all things are both which are in heaven and which are on earth. In the past, Israel had no knowledge of the heavenly places. Their hope was, in a, it was completely vested in the eternal earthly kingdom that God was going to establish here upon the earth. That eternal kingdom is their hope and promise of eternal life and their place of eternal domicile. That was their place to live. That was their hope. In the present dispensation, we have a position in heavenly places, as we just read, and a hope of going to heaven. What do we say today? So common, everybody says our hope is in heaven. We talk about heaven. Heaven, heaven, heaven. Do you hear anybody when they die, I want to go to an eternal kingdom on the earth? Nobody says that, do they? Everybody says, oh, so-and-so is in heaven. I can't wait to go to heaven. We talk about heaven. That's our place. That is our hope. That's our, our eternal domicile, members of the body of Christ. But because we know this to be our destiny, many incorrectly read that back into Scripture, thinking that this has always been the case, failing to see Israel's distinct ministry and Israel's distinct purpose. Heaven was never given to Israel as that promise. They were given the promise of an earthly kingdom whereby the fathers would be resurrected and that they would have eternal life in that kingdom. That is where they expected their life to be. So we have this heaven and earth situation. The foundation of all things, this all things that we're talking about in heaven and earth, Go back to the very beginning of God's Word. Genesis 1.1 says what? In the beginning... Ethan, can you quote it for me? In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. That's right. In the beginning, God created the heaven... Does it say heaven? The heaven and the earth, right? He created that in the beginning. A comparison verse, look over at Colossians chapter 1. It certainly does say heaven, doesn't it? It doesn't just say in the beginning God created the earth. It said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse number 16, a comparison verse. For by Him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ who is the Creator, for by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Visible, that's the earth. Invisible, that's up in heaven. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So what is it that he is gathering together? What are the all things? The all things in Ephesians 1.10 is shown to be down in verse 21. So turn back to Ephesians 1 with me. In Ephesians 1... Verse, let me get the right verse for you. Verse number 20. 
It says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now, what I'm talking about is the all things from earlier in Ephesians, okay? And when he comes down, he's, he's talking about things. When he said in Ephesians 1.10 that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Now, as you read down through the passage, you find out what those things are. Ephesians 1.20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. You notice he's talking there about the principalities and the powers and the might and dominion. Those are places of rulership, power, and authority in a government-like sense. And he's saying he's going to gather all of those things together under God, who is the head of all things. He's going to gather them together in Christ under him. It's no coincidence that when it, Colossians 1 also talks about these things that were created, Go back to Colossians 1. We're going to flip a lot between Colossians and Ephesians. Colossians chapter 1 again. It's no coincidence that when we talked about the all things earlier in Colossians that were created in heaven and earth, it carries through the same, these th same positions pop up again in Colossians. Look at verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or powers, sorry, or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So he's saying that these thrones, these places of principalities and powers, all things were created by him and for him. So when he created the heavens and the earth, when he created that heaven and the earth, he created thrones and principalities and powers and authorities. He didn't just create an earth with the thought of, I'll just leave it be and see what happens. No. He instituted a governmental structure by which there would be powers and authorities that all reported to him. So, again, you see the all things in that verse identified as being these powers. God didn't just create it and leave it alone. He created the heavens and the earth with all of these positions in line to rule. There is order and purpose in the system that God has designed and created. The heavens and the earth are distinct. And included in that distinction are positions, governing positions, authority positions. Those for the heaven and those for the earth. Turn back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. What did God have to say about these things when he created man? Did God say anything about this? Do you recall what he said when he was getting ready to make man? In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion, over the fish of the sea. You see that? Let us create man and let them have dominion. What is dominion? Is that rulership? Is that authority? Is that some authority that's being exercised? Absolutely. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and every living thing that moveth upon the earth. When God created the heaven and the earth, he created these power, these power structures, these governmental structures, to have authority and to have order. 
And when he created man, he created man with the purpose of man having dominion over the earth. To be able to subdue it. Now you want to see something interesting. I, I, I like this verse. Turn over to Job. One of my places, favorite places in the Bible, right, is, and not because I'm like, is in the book of Job. And it's not because I'm thinking to myself, oh great, now Job's finally getting his just due, right? No, but the part where God shows up on the scene and starts talking to Job, and he says, gird up your loins and take it like a man, because I'm getting ready to tell you how it is. And one of the things that, that God told Job is in ver chapter 38, verse 33. He says to Job, he says, Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? You know what ordinances are? That's these, like these principalities, powers, and authorities that he's put in place. There's ordinances in heaven, right? A power structure. He said, Knowest thou the ordinances, ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof on the earth? Job, do you have the power to put these thrones and dominions and principalities and powers that I've put into place in heavenly places? Can you set them up on the earth? He just got done told, telling Job, you know, who are you? You think you could do what I did? Do you think you could loosen Orion's belt? Do you have the strength to pull gravity apart? Can you take these, these positions of power that I have placed and can you set the dominion thereof on the earth? Certainly not. These, this dominion of all positions and power and authority is exactly what we as ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ today are waiting for in this current earthly exiled government. Why do I say that? Well, let's, let's get into a couple of reasons why I say that, right? We are, you understand what I'm saying. We are ambassadors for Christ. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative of a ruler from a foreign land, right? And here we are as ambassadors on earth. Is Christ currently the ruler on, on this earth? He's not. That's why we're ambassadors, right? If Christ were the ruler on this earth, we wouldn't be ambassadors. We would be princes or whatever position, paupers, whatever position we hold under Christ. Whatever position that would be. But we wouldn't be ambassadors. But look at Revelation chapter 1. Notice, in the book of Revelation, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ, this is talking about what's going to happen in the latter days, right? In the end times, the time of Jacob's trial. And notice the very beginning of the book of Revelation, verse 6 says, And hath made us kings and priests unto God. Israel is those, that priestly nation, right? This is, so understand that. But look at the expectation. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. They're waiting for that kingdom to come back in. Where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have dominion. He's going to have power and he's going to rule in that kingdom. And he's going to gather everything under his headship. Now, now I want to ask the question that if you're like me and you first study through these things, you ask the question, what are these positions of power and authority that God is going to reconcile? Well, in Colossians 1.16, similar to Ephesians 1, we saw how Paul described them as thrones, dominions, powers, and principalities, right? So if you think about it, you have God created the heaven and the earth in the beginning, so if you think of the universe as what he created out there, and you think in the center of it, he created this earth. Well, that's not very proportional, is it? But you, you get the picture. So he created the earth, and he created the heavens, and it talks about the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, where God sits. So in these places down here, he created places of principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, these positions of authority. And he did the same thing down here on the earth when he set up 
this structure. So the point I'm trying to make is that you can see that you have it going on in the earth and in the heavens, both of them. And what happens when you have a throne? Oh boy, I can't draw. This is going to get ugly. Ready? So, so here's, a, here's a chair, and uh, so there's your throne, right? That's a two-legged throne, so it's going to fall down. There you go. We give it four legs. But if you have a throne, you have, it's the, when you think of a throne, what do you think of? It's the seat of the governmental authority, right? That's where the power rests. Everything flows down from the throne. What's a dominion? A dominion is like an area that they have rulership over, right? So you could think of, uh, you could think of the United States. And maybe you would think of the, the throne being the president, even though all power is not vested in the president. So just bear with me in my folly of the analogy and just work with me, all right? So imagine, imagine the United States is, is a, a monarchy, right? And there's Florida, Texas, California, Washington. Um, and so you have this monarchy in the U.S. Well, the dominions could be the individual states. You could have Michigan, there's Washington, right? All, all over, you could have different dominions. And what do you have in each one of those states? You have a governor, right, who's running things. And then what do you have within the states? Does the governor take care of every governmental responsibility in the state? No. You have counties, you have cities, you have townships, and you have powers within those counties, powers within those cities, powers within those townships that have governmental authority and responsibility to run those. And who do the cities report to? The county, who do the counties report to? The state, who does the state report to? The country, who's sitting underneath the throne. So I'm just trying to give you a visual representation of something that you're familiar with, of how it's set up upon the earth. This is how it's set up upon the earth, right? This is how he set it up. Why do you think it's any different in the heavenly places? It's not. So he has a throne, which is the seat of governmental authority, dominion, which is an area of governmental authority, and you have the principalities and powers are all governmental authorities down there in those dominions. Um, look over at Titus chapter 3. Titus 3. It says in Titus 3, verse number 1, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. So, what's a principality and a power and a magistrate? Is it some fictitious unicorn out there in the universe that you have no idea what it is? No, of course not. The Bible makes sense. The Bible has terms, and you can understand what it means. When it talks about these principalities, powers, and authorities, it literally means what it says. And so, in Titus, Paul is saying here, that set them in mind to be subject unto them. So, these exist in the real world, right? These are something that existed in the real world that Paul could use as an example to say, be subject unto them. These are the governmental authorities, the mayor, the governor, the governor, the president. You are subject to them and to be ready to every good work. And so again, you see these are positions of rank and authority in the government. Those positions of rank and authority are on the earth. You can see them. These ones on the earth down here, you can see them, right? And they're in the heaven. You can't see those, but they're there. But you can understand what is in the heavens by looking around and seeing what's on the earth. The terminology helps you to understand those positions in heavenly places. You can understand how a principality, a power, a dominion, or a throne works on the earth, and therefore you can understand how it works in heavenly places. You understand the principles and its operations. Okay? Now, turn over to Romans chapter 13. If you're in the adult Sunday school class, not too long ago, we covered Romans chapter 13. As a matter of fact, I remember it was September... We were going through Romans chapter 13, and verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power, no governmental authority, but of God. 
The powers that be are ordained of God. So God set up this governmental authority to control the universe. The universe is not left without order and is not left without authority and is not left without a system of government. And God has ordained it. We know that because look at the next verse. Verse 2 says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. It's something that God has put into place. So, in other words, God established it. He created these positions of rank and authority in government and uh, on the earth. When he established the universe, he set up those positions, and it was a divine establishment, both in the universe and on the earth. So we are part of a program and a system of governmental authority that God established. Unfortunately, right now, physically, in the flesh, we are part of a fallen government, a fallen governmental authority. And the government in the heavens has also seen rebellion. That's why God is seeking for a few good men. Not literally, you know, a few good men, because no man is good enough. But he's looking for men who are faithful. And those men that are faithful, and when I say men, you understand, it includes women too. He's looking for men that are faithful that can be made righteous by him. Because he has a purpose for you. You have a purpose. And it's not the purpose-driven life, your best life now, where, you know, physical blessings and all of these things can be had. People get caught up in governmental affairs down here, but this is not my government. Don't get me wrong, I, I, I love my country, so I don't want to come across as that. Sometimes when you draw a contrast, you come across as disdaining something, and there are parts that I do disdain, but I think we ought to fight for righteousness and against evil on every turn in this government. I'm not against fighting for those things in government. We should fight to persuade men's minds about the things of God and many of the godly principles on which this country was founded, namely freedom on all sides, including individually, economically, limited government, the ability to worship. But my commitment is not to this governmental system, nor is it to our government. Because the Declaration of Independence that I hold allegiance to was not thought up by men, it was conceived in the mind of God. And it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again into the yoke of bondage. That's my declaration of independence, because that's nothing that no man can take away from me. It has far greater value to me than a piece of paper that some men wrote down some declarations on. In 2 Corinthians Chapter 3, it says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And guess who lives in you? That Holy Spirit lives within you, and you have liberty. So I may be put in shackles and bondage in this flesh, but oh, that it is Christ who liveth in me, and there is where I find my liberty. If you enjoy freedom and all that is good, then I invite you to cast your vote for the only perfect government, for that is the side of Christ, to go from death wherein is bondage of sin and enter into life where is peace forevermore. You cast that vote by saying God's right and I'm wrong and believe that Christ died for your wrongs, for your sins, that death, burial, and resurrection. You do that, you become a member of the body of Christ and with your free membership comes a position in the heavenly government. So now let's talk about the rebellion in the current state of affairs. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I was lucky that we got to start early tonight. That means I get to teach longer and you have to sit there longer. Colossians chapter 1. So thinking about the rebellion. So I said that I, I have asserted to you, and we looked at scripture, and I have asserted that God created the heavens and the earth, and he set it up with powers and principalities and authorities and, and this power structure. Yeah? When God created it, who was in control? God. 
Who had the positions out here in heavenly places? The angels. He gave them to angels. He wanted man to have dominion down here on the earth. But in the heavens, it was angels. Well, has man rebelled? He most certainly did. Was there any other rebellion? That was a rebellion that affected the earth. Was there a rebellion that affected the heavenly places? There certainly was. So, we have all of these positions of authority that were created by God and under his control, but are they currently under his control? Some in the heavenly places are, but are they all under his control? Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Now, this is not going to be the answer to it. I mean, this is the answer to my question, but we have a lot further to go. It says in Colossians 1, 18, And he is the head of the body. Who's the head of the body? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Why is he doing this? So that in all things he might have the preeminence. There's a purpose for what is being done here. There's much more of a purpose in the Bible than we give it credit for. God's got a plan that's going on, and it's not the individual plan for your life about where you should go to eat for dinner or what college you should go to or who you should marry. Those things you should use your own wisdom with on biblical principles. But God has a plan and a purpose. You need to find out what that is. And that's what we're talking about tonight. He's saying in Colossians 1 that in all things he might have the preeminence. He's wanting, he was the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That all things there, again, is this positions of power and authority. Does the Lord Jesus Christ have the preeminence in all things today? He surely doesn't. The positions of rank and authority all throughout the whole universe have been usurped from the authority and the headship of God. Turn to Ephesians chapter number 2. Who has usurped it? And who is over the positions of rank and authority today? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 says this, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, you know that's talking about you, right? You Gentiles who were separated and alienated from God. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, lowercase s, that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Who is the prince of the power of the air? Satan is. That's right. John calls him the prince of this world. What's this world? It's this earth, right? John calls him the prince of this world. You think that's a position of power and authority? Yeah. What, what did Satan tempt Christ with? Positions of power and authority, didn't he? He says, he took him up on the high mountain, he says, everything you see, I'll give to you. What? Well, how could Satan give him something that was already his if it wasn't Satan's? Satan has usurped that authority in this fallen state. That position of authority belonged to Satan, but God is going to reconcile all things back unto himself through Christ. Israel was looking for thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? They were looking for a reconciliation on earth like, is, like, like in the heavenly places with God ruling right now. Now, God is ruling in heavenly places, right? But does that mean all of these places of authority are reporting to him and have allegiance to him? Well, there's an interesting place in the Bible later that we'll look at that will give you the answer to that question. So Satan has caused a fallen state on the earth and convinced some of the angels in heaven to rebel with him. But God is still ruling the heaven unlike the earth, and that is why Israel is looking for his will to be done here as it is there. Isaiah 14 laid down a wise plan, and I'll read it to you for the sake of time. It laid down the wise plan and the policy of revolt against the throne of God, whereby Satan was going to possess the heaven and the earth. You know what he said to himself? Satan said, I'll be like the most high. I'll be like the most high. Notice those words, most high. It's Isaiah chapter 14, if you want to write it down, I'll read it real quick, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? 
How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. If someone ascends, is that good or bad? Well, in, in, our, in our language, that's a good thing, right? We talk about people climbing the corporate ladder. Or we talk about if people fall down, then that has a negative connotation and they need to get back up again, right? They need to pick themselves up. If a king is sitting upon a throne, what do they do to the throne? You ever seen a picture of a throne room? Where do they sit the throne? Do they sit the throne on the same level as the people who walk into the room? Most certainly not. They put the throne up on an elevation, right? They put the throne up on an elevation so it sits in a high place. What did the people do in Israel when they worshipped the false gods? Where did they put their altars? In the high places. So here we have Satan's plan of rebellion is, I want these positions of power and authority. I want to be like the Most High God. I want to be the ruler. I want to call the shots. So, he wants to ascend into heaven. These being high elevationally is talking about authority. And Lucifer says, I want to ascend into heaven. He says, I'll sit upon the mount. What's a mount? Mountain goes up, right? I'll sit upon the mount. He says, I'll be like the most high. He says, I'm not going to go high. I'm going to be like the Most High. You can't get any higher than the Most High. You notice that's a name for God? He's the Most High. Why? Because you can't get any higher than Him. He's the one on the, the top throne. Most High is that name of God that describes His authority and headship over the heaven and the earth. He doesn't just possess it. It's not like God just created the heaven, and the, the heaven and the earth and he just possesses it. No, rather he has down here, uh, he has all things under his authority within his governmental power. Everything was as it should have been when he created it. Then Satan comes along in his pride and he wants to be the supreme authority. And he wants to usurp the position that God has. And he tries to get the angelic creation in the heavens and mankind down upon the earth, these little X's that I drew up here. He tries to get these people who have places of dominions, of powers in the universe, where this guy rules over this quadrant, this dominion, this dominion, and this area. And they have these positions of power and authority. And he, he tries to get these people to join him in his rebellion and um, in, uh, in these places of authority that God has created. And Lucifer has been very successful in his attempt. So now there are these dominions and principalities and authority in heaven and earth, open rebellion against God, and God has allowed it to continue to exist. When the angels fell, he didn't just wipe them off and say you're gone and those positions are now vacant. There's now still positions of power that are in rebellion against God. Turn to Daniel chapter 10. Some of you may know where we're going to when we go to Daniel chapter 10. Right after the book of Ezekiel, you have Daniel chapter 10. It says in verse 12, then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day... Now, what was that first day? Back in verse 3, Daniel talks about how three weeks earlier, he had started fasting and praying unto God. He was under tremendous turmoil, and he starts fasting and praying unto God. And here, the angel says unto them, Fear not, from, from the first day... When was the first day? When Daniel started mourning morning, three weeks earlier, that thou didst set in thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Notice the angel says, three weeks ago when you started praying, when you started mourning, God heard you. And he sent me. For that reason I have come. 
Look at verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. How many is one and twenty? That's twenty-one. Twenty-one divided by seven days in a week. That's three weeks. And how long was it since Daniel started mourning? Three weeks. So from the very instant Daniel started mourning and praying, God sent the angel. He got down here, and it says, the, kingdom of, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Now, do you think that an earthly man down here, do you think that's talking about an earthly power, or do you think that's talking about a heavenly power? That's talking about a heavenly power, because there's no earthly fleshly man that can hold a spirit being. Yeah? So, he says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So he says, the kingdom of Persia, this prince of the kingdom of Persia, this guy right here, he's one of the bad guys. He joined Satan's rebellion. I came down here, Daniel, to talk to you, but I got held up. And he withstood me. And it took God dispensing one of the chiefs up here, who had a higher power and a higher authority than this prince of the kingdom of Persia, to come down here and to set me free so that I could now get to you and come talk to you. So you see that there's a position of power and authority in heavenly places that are still in open rebellion against God. So we have this rebellion, and it's real, and it's going on in the heavens and the earth. What is going to happen to rectify this situation? What could be done? What is God going to do? Well, first we have the reconciliation of the earth. This you're familiar with the Lord Jesus Christ came in his earthly ministry to minister to Israel. He came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He was going to restore the literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom, whereby he would rule on a throne from Jerusalem and would rule over the whole world with the nation of Israel. The twelve apostles would sit on twelve thrones over the twelve tribes of Israel. Israel would be the light to rule the whole world. And through this, Christ would reconcile the whole earth unto himself, ruling in that kingdom. God's purpose with the nation of Israel, his earthly people, his kingdom nation, is to restore the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ back over the planet earth that is in rebellion. Jesus Christ will be their king, and through that nation he will go out and he will restore his headship. That's, why he, that's what he died on Calvary to accomplish. But we read back in Ephesians where he's going to reconcile all things unto himself. So that's the plan for the earth. What about the heavens? If that's how he's going to reconcile the positions of powers, principalities, authorities on earth, the next question in your mind should be, what about the heavens? What about those positions up there? Satan tried to prevent Christ from reconciling the earth, right? He had him crucified. He tried to destroy the seed line had him crucified, and even if Christ did reconcile the positions on earth through his earthly kingdom, Lucifer, in his mind, still had the positions of power and authority in heavenly places. Even if he brought in the earthly kingdom, I still have the heavens. I still have those positions. But the cross work accomplished something much worse for Lucifer than he ever could have imagined. It turns out he wasn't so wise after all. God concealed something from him. Lucifer thought to himself that he was so wise that no secret could be withheld from him. That's what it says in Ezekiel chapter 28. He, he, Lucifer's problem was pride. He, God created him wise, and in his wisdom, he was prideful, and he wanted more, and he wanted power, and he wanted authority. And he thought that no man could hide anything from him. But you know what? God revealed a mystery to the Apostle Paul. A mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Romans chapter 16. What is that mystery? The mystery you see is that in order for the Lord Jesus Christ to have preeminence in all of the positions of rank and authority, not just upon the earth, but also in the heavenly places, He has formed the church, the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a special group. Not of the prophetic program, but of the mystery program. It is the secret purpose that God had. 
It is a new kind of human being, a new species of mankind. It is a group of people who will be born from the dead, of which you recall that Christ was the firstborn from the dead, to give us life, Colossians 1, and has given unto us spiritual life. When you got saved and God put you into the body of Christ, God conformed you to the image of His Son. That's something different, isn't it? That's a change. And with this righteousness and one day a glorified body, and as a position of a joint heir with Christ, and with the capacity that God will use us, the body of Christ, He will use that capacity to reconcile the heavenly positions of power and of authority. And He will remove the fallen angels and replace them with the body of Christ. And those, those fallen angels will be there no more. How did He do it? He did it by reconciliation. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. It says, <clears throat> I'll give you a second to get there. I'm getting anxious. Colossians chapter 1. How did he do it? How did he pull off this mystery? How, did he, how is he putting Gentiles, how is he going to put them in positions of power and authority in the universe? Who would have thunk it? But He's done it because He's reconciled us. Colossians 1.21 And you, that's you Gentiles. Hey you, wake up. You Gentiles, wake up. You who were dead, you know, who were in your vain imaginations and without God. This is what He did for you. He said, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled. He's brought you back together. He also reconciled both Jew and Gentile in one body, in the body of Christ. That Colossians 1.21, talking about you hath he reconciled, that's individually you, right? But there's also a reconciliation of the body of Christ. He's reconciled the body of Christ unto God, and he will one day reconcile all things unto himself, which we read earlier. In the dis dispensation of the fullness of times. He will reconcile the heavens and the earth and all of the principalities, powers, and dominions that come along with it back under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will reclaim the governmental authority. Colossians 2 and verse number 10 says, And ye are complete in Him. You know that part, right? But are you as familiar with the part that comes after that? It says, And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to be put as the head, the centerpiece of all creation. By Him were all things created and by Him all things exist. And He will be put on display as the centerpiece of the creation with all power and authority underneath Him as the head. And by reconciling us, His plan to have us reconcile the heavenly places unto Himself, He's put Satan to an open shame. Look at verse 15 there of the chapter you're in. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Triumphing over them in it. He said, having spoiled principalities and powers, what happens when you spoil something? You know, the army goes in and they call it the spoils of war because you go in and you take it. And he, has, he says, spoiling them, he's already accomplished the means by which he's going to do it. Has he done it yet? No, no, we're living in the mystery period. He's being merciful and he's being patient. But he's already accomplished the means. Satan's a dead duck. He's got nothing left. He ain't got a card up his sleeve. So in conclusion, and you know when I say in conclusion, we're still going to go to five verses, right? So in conclusion... When all means all, it really is going to mean all. The ultimate reason for the formation of the body of Christ has to do with the filling up of the positions of rank and authority out there under one head. And that head is the Lord Jesus Christ. In the ages to come, everything will be placed under His subjection as He reigns. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 19... Now, I just want to read some verses here, 
And I just want you, based upon what we've talked about, about the principalities and powers and authority, what Christ accomplished on the cross, what he's going to do with the body of Christ and reclaiming these things, I just want you to, as we read through these verses, think about those things. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him, in Christ, should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 28 says this, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. When all means all. Ephesians chapter 1. Turn to Ephesians 1. We'll read a few verses there. Again, just keeping in mind the things that we've talked about tonight. Ephesians chapter 1. And verse number 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Don't you think it pleased the Father to put him in that position after he turned down Satan's offer? And every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Ephesians 1.9 Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. He is making known unto us the mystery of His will today. He's putting it on display. You are in on the secret. You have the information. The one hid from Satan. The one that exposed Satan and put him in open shame. He says, God says, I'm now showing you the secret of all that I had in my mind before the foundation of the world to be accomplished in the cross of Christ. The mystery of God the Father's will is to bring that whole system, the whole system, both heaven and earth, back under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ by virtue of the cross work. In Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that's when, that's when it's going to happen, he might gather together in one, He's going to gather them together. We're going to be on the same side under him that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. In him. Where are you today? We're in Christ. And in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He's going to reconcile all of those places of principalities and powers and authority together unto Him in Him. That God may be all in all, Corinthians says. So all things are going to be reconciled and all things are going to be in Christ. What a glorious time that'll be. Something that we have to look forward to. That's our hope. And it's definitely something to be thankful for. You know, so many people think that the Bible is just about what Christ did on the cross. Don't diminish that. That's the gospel. That's so wonderful. But the Bible also teaches you and puts on display the manifold wisdom of God and gives it to you for you to understand. <laughs> and it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Let's pray.
Lord, we love you. We thank you for another day that you've given us. Another day, Lord, that you've granted your, your grace to us. We're thankful for your mercy of people who so much don't deserve it. And as we study these things tonight about the mystery of your will, and the things that you are going to accomplish, Lord, um, I just stand in awe and think of how I'm, I'm undeserving in, in all ways of your mercy and your salvation, life, and all that you've given me. And to think that, Lord, you've given us not only life, <laughs> but you're going to grant us places of privilege, positions of privilege in your family. Uh, your, your grace and your mercy is truly overwhelming. And we love you. We thank you for all these things. In Christ's name, amen.